His mighty work. For today's study of God's word, let's turn our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 30. The next verse in line of this magnificent chapter on the life of men of faith. Hebrews chapter 11 <clears throat> verse 30. A wonderful picture of a famous story that we often teach our children in Sunday school and we ourselves are familiar with, bringing down the Jericho wall. And it is presented to us as an act of faith, an act of faith. And we read, Hebrews 11.30 By faith the wall of, walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. And again the Holy Spirit teaches us in this wonderful chapter how genuine so rather, how genuine and strong faith in the Lord will prepare his people to become instrumental in fulfilling his mighty plans. And by faith, they become instruments in God's hand to channel his mighty power. To accomplish his mighty plans. Wonderful thing that we notice here is that. When we walk about by faith. By faith alone. We will see we being instrumental. In such a way that surpasses. The natural and mundane means of life. God is so wonderful that he's able to arrange day-to-day -day happenings of life to work out his end. But at times, he surpasses all those things that are ordinary and work out his plan through extraordinary means. And that's his call. That's his appointment according to his time and for that he often uses God's people who live by faith the bringing down of Jericho wall was an extraordinary event because it was brought down not by means of war machines or huge weaponries or engines of any kind. There was not a finger that was laid on that wall to pluck out a brick or even a grain of sand or cement from it. Of course, I know you would say there was no cement at that time or whatever they used to plaster it. Absolutely no human effort to bring it down. And that it came down. That's the thing. And how did it come down? By faith. Would you believe that? Well, you can't because it's by faith. Only if you exercise faith, you can believe this. By the application of your natural logic, you can never understand this particular phrase. It looks like some madness. By faith... The walls of Jericho fell down. Really, if you don't have faith, this is the most absurd statement. By faith, the walls of a powerful city brought down. Extraordinary, unexplainable, beyond any man's comprehension. The capture of Jericho 
was selected for mention not only because of the extraordinary character but also it marks out the beginning of what he is going to say next in verse 31 onwards. In verse 31, we have the story of Rahab, a woman who lived in Jericho, a prostitute who was converted and became a believer in the Lord, our Redeemer. And so, dear friends, what we have here is the, is the description of the faith of God's people, Joshua and his company, not only to conquer, but also to convert. And this is wonderful. When God's people exercise their faith, you will see them being guided by the providence of God through extraordinary means. God might rip them of all the natural abilities and capabilities and then tell them, charge! And they would say, Lord, what is there to charge? You know, there's nothing here. Just charge. And when they go forward like that, the Lord will use them not only to conquer what he wants them to conquer, but even to convert those who are watching by the side. Because they become trophies of God's magnificent power and nothing else. You see, the most beautiful thing about a Christian's life is that there is nothing about himself but all about God's power. That's what Christianity is. Christianity is not half man and half God. It is about God working perfectly through God's people. I am not eliminating human responsibilities. We will insist that because it's part of God's plan. But when people see us from outside, they know this man yielded to God by faith. But look, God did the rest. And God will be the most attractive person and not the Christian or the believer. If he has any attraction at all in all these things, it's because he is one with God. It is going to be God's glory that will be shared by this person who moved forward by faith. And so, in order to understand this whole story fully, we need to refer to the record of this event in the Old Testament portion which is in Joshua chapter 6. You may open up your Bible to Joshua chapter 6. <clears throat> and I told you this is an extraordinary event, an extraordinary victory that God gave by, to Joshua and his team who exercise the faith. But let me tell you why this is extraordinary. Look at verse 1. Joshua 6, 1. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. I hope you can understand the full spiritual force behind this particular verse. I mean, you may read it and say, What's, what? It, you know, it's just a report of what the people in Jericho did. When the Israelites were coming in and they knew that it can be danger. So they fortified their walls and gates so the Israelites cannot enter and conquer. Well, let's go to the next one. They may think like that, but you must remember certain things at this time. First of all, Jericho was a frontier city to the land of Canaan. It was the first city that the Israelites had to come in contact with the moment they entered the promised land. 
They had many victories by now when they traveled through the wilderness. But they never met a people who lived in walled city up till now. Others lived in the plains, open to the attack of the enemy. Yes, they had to pitch very hard battles. But this is altogether a different scenario. The people in Jericho are not going to come out and meet them for a battle in the fields. They are going to stay within the walls and throw a challenge to the Israelites. If you want, come and get us. If you want to conquer our land, it's not easy. We are not going to come and meet you and shake your hand or give ourselves to be victims of your ploys. If you want, come and get us. For that, get the wall down first if you can. And they have made everything they can do. They made sure that they can never, or Israelites can never get in. They did everything they could do to keep Israel out of the city. And so that's why we read Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. Straightly shut up as the idea not only shut but barred and bolted. They make sure even if all of the Israelites come and push the gate it will not collapse. You know, in those days, people were already so advanced in construction. They may not have the modern steel bars and uh, modern cement and concrete mixture and so on. Nonetheless, they knew how to use whatever the nature has provided around them in such a fashion that it will provide a very strong defense for themselves. Almost an impregnable fortress. So the people in Jericho was challenging Israel to a physical war. The Lord is going to tell them it's not necessary. I don't need my people to take any weapon in this matter. Let's see what's going on. Read the next verse in Joshua 6. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, the king thereof, and the mighty men of Valor. So you see, my dear friends, there was a king in Jericho, and he had mighty men of valor. That is the Lord's opinion. In God's own analysis of the military capabilities of this city, the Lord says, they are really warriors. Best equipped, best trained, anytime ready to fight. So the reason why they don't come out to fight is not because they are frightened cowards. It's not because they think they can't take the arms and beat uh, this group of Israelites. They are well trained. War hardened people. God knew it. The Lord said well. Let it be. Let them have that wonderful. Accolade given to them. And then God goes on to say to Joshua. Ye shall compass the city. All ye men of war. Interesting. The Lord says, well, all among you who can fight, let them rise up and r surround the city. Go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make long blasts with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, 
and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Now that is a prediction of things to come. This is God's plan. This is God's strategy. And you see none in that strategy that looks like a military action. Except that God called a man of war. It is almost like a ridiculing plan. You know why? Here God says, bring on your warriors. But let me tell you, let them don't carry war, you know, spears and shields and any weaponry. But let them just march around this six days, one time a day. And on the seventh day, let them walk seven times. Of course, seven priests in front and blowing the ram's horns. Seventh day, seven priests leading seven times around the city. Seven, seven, perfection. God says my plan is perfect. It may look very, very foolish. It may make no connection to what you are going to do. But just do it as I have told you. City wall will come falling down. Isn't it extraordinary? Because you can never see a war strategy like this. You can never. So extraordinary. Now dear friends. There is yet another thing I want you to take note of the extraordinary nature of this event. Even before Israel came close to the city, God already instilled within them a terror. You know that from Joshua chapter 2, where we see the spies going into the land and meeting with a woman, a prostitute, Rahab. You know that story. Now look at chapter 2, verses 9 to 14. And what did Rahab say to those who came to spy the land? And she said unto the men, verse 9 of chapter 2 of Joshua, I know that the Lord had given you the land. She says, I know. God already gave. They have not come close to it yet. They have not crossed Jordan River yet. They are still on the other side. But already Rahab says, I know. You see, the Lord started working. The Lord already chose this woman from her sins, sanctified her, and given her the understanding. See how spectacular the Lord is. He already made the move before anybody realized. The hearts were already affected in one way or the other for its destruction and the victory of Israel. So she went on to say, I know that the Lord gave, had given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us. So she is not talking about herself. She is talking about the city dwellers in general. And that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Oh, look at that. They are worried to the point they can't even stand straight up. They are fainting, it says. They are weakened. God doesn't need many armies to pull the trigger or send the missiles. He knows how to affect every man and bring down him. And then it says, For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. You see, it doesn't say how Moses dried up, or Israelites did, but the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when he came out of Egypt. And what he did under the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Sihon, and Og, whom he utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. <laughs> heart did melt. If your heart is melted like this, you are good for nothing, let me tell you. 
You may look beautiful, you may look very powerful, you may have a brilliant mind, but if your emotions are so terribly affected, you can't even get your mind work for you. Soon, as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man. So much for the men of valor. They all became men without power and strength. You know, one of the most important things in a battle, especially when the battle is so hot and so difficult, is mental toughness. Uh, I recently read briefly about the American SEALs. They are the special commandos of American Navy, uh, which is which was constantly trained to get Osama bin Laden. And the training was so tough, you know, after some time they get so wary because of the training, they will come up with a new team ready. Because the, the, the whole um, training itself can be very tough. And I believe these men were well prepared. But imagine, if your heart is not strong, what can you do? There's nothing you can do. But God has done that. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Amen. Now therefore I pray you swear unto me by the Lord since I have showed you kindness that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token that ye will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. I'm going to stop there because we are going to take Rahab's story God willing next week when I preach again. And so there you have at least one woman in that city of wickedness and military engagements and entanglements that says, I got nothing to do with the city where I lived. My father's lived here. My family is here. I now abandon this whole city because they have no courage, no strength to stand up. Now, dear friends, the extraordinary thing about it, the Lord still prove himself to be a God of salvation. That's the most beautiful thing. Get some in a BP church and all my dear brothers and sisters, you must remember something. In whatever we do, the ultimate, the most extraordinary thing that the Lord wants you to accomplish is the salvation of souls. Whether it will be an issue with your sickness and its healing, or whether it's an issue with your job, or you know, finding a new one because you don't have enough money, or a business uh, advancement, or uh, you know, any achievement in life, whether it's exams or all that. The ultimate reason if God would help you is that you may become a token of God's goodness and mercy and power, and others may fear the Lord and turn to Him. That's the whole thing. It is not just about gaining material success. No. If that material success does not glorify Christ, if it doesn't translate into the salvation of souls, what is the point of all these accumulations and success in life? It's useless. Our church as a whole must always remember this. We must be valiant by faith so that God can use us in his own extraordinary ways for the salvation of souls. Some may be cooking. Some may be sending letters. Some may be fixing the internet so that the word of God may be spread. Some may be copying the sermons went to CDs and DVDs and thumb drives and get it, making it available for people to download. Some may be printing. Some may be talking. Well, we do all these ultimately in the best way so that Christ will be preached. No other business here. If we ask for money, it's not to make big houses for ourselves or to drive a big car. It is for the glory of Christ. If you understand 
the plan of God in this regard, then let me tell you, you will be the person that the Lord is going to use. If your vision of God's purposes in this world is sort of twisted and mangled with materialistic ideas, God is not going to use you. It is for the glory of Christ. This entire world is redeemed, uh, created. It is for the glory of Christ. We are redeemed. For his praise. And it must be praised. Even in the hearts of the prostitutes. And drunkards. And murderers. And all sorts of wicked men. That still roam in this world. And God has a way of doing it. If God has chosen us. Are we not very honored? And God didn't choose us. Because we are great men of material prosperity and uh, all other cleverness and abilities. No. Simply he chose us. And all that he require of us is to be men and women of faith. So that extraordinary things might be accomplished. Yes, there will be walls in our path. There will be Jericho walls in our journey toward accomplishing God's ways. When God sends us to frontiers that have not yet been conquered, there will be great, great, great problems. This is almost like a missionary story. You know, a whole nation is sent to a land to claim it for Christ. That Christ may be born in that land. In a way, Joshua and his contemporaries were prepared to get this land so one day the prophecies concerning Christ might be fulfilled. We cannot forget these things. You know, let's not be so limited in our perspective that it's everything about me and my studies, my family, my bank statements. You know, that's so limited, nothing. Come on, have a wider, global, universal, infinite perspective of things that God wants us to have. How, how foolish we are when we have an infinite God leading us and sending us and charging us forward. We are just limited by little things. Should we be like Lot's wife who gets so stuck in her own Sodom and Gomorrah? She, she should have ran away from that place and see what God is going to do. But some of us are like this. Faith requires that you have a mind that will think the way God wants you to think. Not the way the world wants you to think. Not the way you yourself want to think. Then your perspectives will have its largeness, its extraordinary ways, and the glory of God fulfilling itself. Let me go to the next aspect of my message today. This wonderful event was not only extraordinary beyond man's ways, according to God's ways, it also gave us a lesson concerning the kind of faith we must have. Recently a brother who listens to my preaching on the internet, he comes from one of the sister churches of ours, and he said, Pastor Koshi, I realized how our faith need to be nurtured. I've been so blessed by hearing your message. Can you please tell your Bible Witness Media team to put all the messages on Hebrews 11 when you finish with it? I want a collection. I've listened to it many times. But I want to make sure some years later, if the Lord gives me the time, that I will listen to it again. Because the tendency is that our faith, we, t uh, we forget things about faith. And we get easily entangled in the ways of the world. We don't allow faith to work. I cannot afford any more in the rest of my life 
to live that way. That's what that gentleman said. I said, okay, I will tell our people to get it ready for you. These are extraordinary ways. I never thought that what I preach here can have such impact. If it would, blessed be his name. Get so many brothers. Have you ever thought our church will have this kind of influence around the world? When you get the annual report, you listen, uh, you read what uh, the Bible Witness Media team has to say about the number of countries from which people listen to us. Let their testimony reveal it. I will keep you excited about it to read. Even though it's only one sentence, I hope you read it with faith. We never planned for this. God did that work. We are not a mighty congregation. We don't have what others have. But we set out to do little things by faith. Make no sense sometimes. But God was pleased to use us. Never ever despise the things that God has asked you to do. It is not running around and trying to do great things which you are not called to do. It is a thing that the Lord has called to do that matters. And you may, see, you may not see the connection, how this is going to make a great impact. That's not your business. Your business is not to judge what God says is right or wrong, or whether God has appointed is the right place or not. That's God's business. And he will never ask you to do his business if it's not going to work out. So, as I'm now preparing my heart to tell you how our faith should work, I pray that you will understand this. Faith is not about you kicking, kicking up a fuss about what you're going to do. It's not about you trying to kickstart something in your heart. It is entirely giving yourself to God and see how we can formulate this. Firstly, faith must be entirely built upon the divine word of direction and promises. Because we just now read from Joshua chapter 6 in verses 2 to 5. That the Lord spoke to Joshua. Only a person who is constantly open to commune with God can have a faith like this. Do you talk with your God? Do you listen to Him? Do you have your private communion with your God every day? Now don't talk about your faith as though it is great if you don't have the habit of sitting before the Lord and asking him, Lord, what thou hast for me today, what thou shalt have me to do, teach me. What do you want me to do as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a child, as a pastor, as a deacon, as an elder? What do you want me to do? I, I'm telling you, my dear friends, many a time, all of us, fall into a danger, a spiritual peril, such as not listening to God and doing everything that what we feel like doing or what people want us to do. And we lose focus. We are not, we are not building the affairs of our life according to what God wants us to do. It's the plans that you have dreamed about. It's about ple pleasing some people who are close to you. Is there anyone who is closer to you than your God? If there is someone who is closer than God, then you are not a man of faith. Or at least, I would say, you have failed to exercise your faith. Because faith takes God first and His Word. And it does not allow anything or anyone to ever influence Joshua was in this land. Please take note. 
Joshua, Caleb, and ten other spies. He knew what this place is going to be. He knew this is a place that will put up a big fight. And the possibility of Israel being eradicated from the face of the earth was looming large in his mind, especially by the voices of the ten who did not believe. And when they came back to give the report, the entire nation sang the same chorus of the unbelieving spies. Didn't God deal with them? Only Joshua and Caleb who left Egypt were allowed to cross the river of Jordan to face this battle. The rest all perished on the other side. Do you know something very uh, interesting about Hebrews chapter 11? After the account of Moses, we have not one single statement about the 40 years of wilderness journey, which was spectacular. There was providing of manna. There was bringing out of water from the rock. There were so many miracles that the Lord did, giving of the Ten Commandments. But strangely, nothing was cited from there. Not that must be, but what you see about the people of Israel during the 40 years was mainly unbelief. Not many, many examples there of faith. Of course, there was Moses, there was Joshua and Caleb. God did cite them here. But generally, that generation of people were characterized by unbelief than faith. So, what was their unbelief? Disobedience. You remember how they made the golden calf? When God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses in Mount Sinai. The unbelief was about not following God's word. I fear this for you, you and me. That we can be so preoccupied by the way of the world. The system of the world. That we would say, ha, don't be stupid to say the Bible says this so we must be like this. Let's be more you know, practical. A lot of people think the Bible is not practical. They refuse the Bible to set the direction. They refuse the Bible to, to, to tell us, don't do that, but do this. You can't have faith taking hold of extraordinary blessings of God if it's not going to be directed by the divine word. See, a divine word is given that we might be directed by it. We can't live a life of faith if we are disconnected with God's word. Faith, when it is exercised, will acknowledge the authority of God's word. That's what Joshua did. Do you acknowledge the authority of God's word over every aspect of your life or you push him out on certain aspects of your life then faith is not exercised to say that faith must be built upon the divine word for direction promise also means that you are confident that the God has the power to fulfill all he says no matter how strange and disconnected his ways may appear with regard to what you are going to accomplish. And it means your fidelity to God's word, your faithfulness, your unwillingness to step aside from the truth, your unwillingness to think differently or even to appropriate or even, even think favorably of anything that does not match with God's word. How wonderful and exemplary was such a faith that Joshua and his people exhibited at Jericho.
Now the second thing that I'm going to say about faith is something that I already mentioned but I want to refocus on it. Faith does not require a connection between what God has said and the final end. God's good faith, genuine faith, strong faith does not require a connection between God's command and the end. I mean, it does not mean, it does not require a connection that will please his logic. He sees God himself as the connection. Because God said it, so it will come to pass. He does not seek the connection in any other intellectually satisfying aspects of the world's affair. Well, generally speaking, as I mentioned a while ago, the divine arrangements are such that normally great things are achieved through mundane things, the normal things that we do day to day. But there will be times when God would specifically tell you to do something and then you wonder, but, but you asked me to do this, but you didn't tell me to do that. So how is he going to do that if I'm going to do this? Very strange. God gave me a wife to apply. God gave me three children. I'm supposed to provide for them a house. Can't bring them up in the streets <laughs> or somebody else's house. It's not right. Got to have a roof over their head. I need to provide for the education. But the Lord sent me to get some money, and they couldn't pay a good salary. So, how can I be in get some money and bring up my family? I don't see the connection. If 1991 and 90 or until 1996, just give you a period of time, if you were given a salary of 600 to 1,000 dollars at that range. In fact, 1991 was 250. That's where I started. Will you like to think that you can surely bring up your family? I'm not blaming the church, okay? Please don't get me wrong. That's all they could do. I always said that. But I'm just telling you, you don't have to see the connection. You've got to believe God is able to do it. So I have many good friends here who have gone into the ministry. Many times you just have to believe in math divine mathematics, not your mathematics. Because your calculator cannot work out a system to show you how these two can be connected. But you know you can do no other but obey God. You can do nothing but believe that whatever God said he will accomplish. I used to tell the Lord, Lord, how I can be a pastor if I don't provide for my family? If I don't rule my house well, if I don't take care of them, how could I be a pastor to look after the rest of the church? So please, let me not, not be a beggar. And if I'm going to wash cars and sweep floors to make some money so I can feed my children, I'm, I will not have time to prepare for sermons and do all the things that you want me to do. And because, you know, in those years, not so much in these days, but in those years, I hardly slept. Not doing a second job for supporting my family, but doing more and more for the work in Gethsemane. And I said, I had to cry out to God. And some of you here may have Jericho wall in your life. It's an obstacle to see how God will accomplish the other side of things. Can be problems in your business, can be problems in your family. 
Maybe you're married into a family where you've said to your husband, I will love your mom, I will love your dad, but now that particular lady is after you, or you feel so, and you don't know what to do. You say, oh no, I can't love this lady, I hate her. You can't even say that. You have to honor the father and mother. You find it so difficult. You can't see how this will be connected. Or you may be a mother or father who loved your son so much. Now she, he brings a girl. Oh, you don't know how you're going to put up with that. I just give you one example. I'm not attacking anybody. <laughs> don't get me wrong, please. These are realities of life, isn't it? Problems, maybe in workplace, in the family, in your studies. You want to do well. But it's just that you, you don't seem to absorb things. You don't know how things will work. And you feel like saying, I'm not going to study because nothing gets into my heart. Nothing gets into my mind. Uh, I'm going to watch TV. I'm going to play marbles or computer or what. You don't want to do anything. You want to give up. No. You have a work to do. Go. Read. Read. Even though you don't, don't understand, just read. Because that's your calling. You can't make sense sometimes of things that are going to happen. But you better know what is your calling. And stay committed. And God knows how to make the connections. You know, we often see like a line with dots, you know, made of dots. They are not joined. And it is not our duty to join these dots. God will join it. When you are at one dot, you just do what you are asked to do by faith in that dot. Let the Lord to make the bridge to the next position. And he would do it. We must believe this. Joshua, this is the first city you have to fight. There are many more before you conquer the land. And now let me tell you, and let me show you, the conquering of the entire land has nothing to do with the strength of men. You know, a while ago I said, the plan of God looks really illogical. But I want to say something else. It also looks like a bit humiliating to the men of war in Israel. Because God said to Joshua, wake up all the men of war and go around. I mean, what's the point of people who are trained to fight? Walk around the wall. Then they may be a Joshua. That's all. Go home. Okay, go home. Why? God said so. God said so. Go home. Can we walk one more time because we are strong? No, only once a day. Joshua, why not we do this? It is not in the Bible, okay? This is extra biblical. <laughs> I'm just translating the way man thinks sometimes. Joshua, why not we do this? Since we are strong, let's walk seven days non-stop and show them we are, we are strong enough to walk seven days and still fight. No! Once a day. On the seventh day, you will walk seven times. And who is going to lead? The priest. Huh? Priest. They know how to fight or not. No, they will lead. So what are they going to do? Blow the trumpet. Blow the horn. Huh? Blow the horn? <laughs> the, the interesting thing is, you can't not only see the connection, you get confused sometimes. Because things doesn't seem to join. Disjointed. But my dear friends, nothing is disjointed. Here is a message not so much to the people of Jericho, but to the people of Israel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. My word shall accomplish. My counsel shall stand. You do what I say. So in whatever be your fears and struggles, may I just encourage you by saying, focus on what the Lord wants you to do now. And stop worrying. Leave it to the hand of the Lord who has already written your story. Sometimes I think, you know, only if we can see things on a hindsight, you know, uh, many things that happened over, uh, over the past 20 years with regard to our church and my life. Sometimes I wish, oh, in those days I knew this is what is going to be. 
1991, I knew that this is how Gethsemane is going to be. How easy it would have been. I would have just pressed on. <laughs> but God doesn't give that uh, vision to us. The only thing he says is, now do this and don't move. Be steadfast and unmovable. Do this. Obey his word. And he knows what to do at the end. So faith doesn't require a connection all the time. It leaves, it leaves it to the Lord who commands. A thing that I said, but let me put it as a point to you. A faith that would take extraordinary experiences in life will manifest itself in practical obedience. Not imaginatory obedience. Not in assumed obedience, neither in delayed obedience, but in practical, immediate obedience. They complied with everything the Lord said. You can read more of their compliance in Joshua chapter 6. Let me just quickly read a verse from Joshua 6 verse 8. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets an ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them and then verse 10, since you are looking into your Bible, I can hear you turning the pages. Verse 10, and Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. You see how strict he was? He just makes sure they never do anything more. Not even a whisper, he said. No screaming. Silent walk. It is almost like uh, people walking behind a coffin, right? Quiet. A minute of silence like that. What a people of war do it? Normally when people charge into the battlefield, they shout, Woo! They all scream, Go! Charge! This is absolute silence. Maybe some would have said, again I'm imagining, <laughs> Joshua, are you sure? At least we make some noise. Let the people in Jericho know we are around. No. You will have your time. Until then, no word. Absolutely nothing. You know, my dear friends, sometimes life can be very difficult. The best thing you can do is just be quiet. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. That is practical obedience. Not talking a lot. Trying to make sense. Pick up the phone. Hello, are you there? My pastor says this. My husband says this. My wife says this. Do you think it makes any sense? Yeah, no sense. All right, I quit. You can't do that. Be obedient. Genuine faith always leads to a course of conduct in harmony with the character of God and his word. Well, my dear friends, here is the last thing I want to share with you about faith. As they perceived in obedience, we see faith was completely vindicated by God. As we read in Hebrews 11.30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down. We come back to the place where we started. Faith is extra, I mean, the experience of faith is extraordinary. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. 
And everything that they did was trying to say, nothing you do is useful. <laughs> Just imagine the things they did perfectly seven times until the seventh day. It was a message that says, God shall have glory. He shall do it by his own hand. In fact, God suggested things that had no effect whatsoever on the wall. What was he saying? You just believe me, okay? And show your faith by walking around this for seven days. That's all. Just walk around. Let me do it. And that faith was completely vindicated. The, fall fell, the wall fell down flat. And we read in Joshua 6 that the people went up into the city and every man straight before him and they took the city. Oh my dear friends, how else can I bring this message to you but by saying, if you live in faith, the walls that you see in front of you, they will come down in God's time. If it will take seven days, let it take seven days. If it will take seven months, let it take seven months. But he will never be late. He will be on time to help you. Do only that which is according to God's word. Trust him fully. Yours is a victory. Let us close our worship.